saying that, Coco has a, B, a bachelor's in marine biology from Occidental College and a master's in botany. Mr. Will Smith came at home here in Yuchimanoa. And he works at the Nature Conservancy where he is the Kaneohe Bay Marine Coordinator. And he's also the executive director of Coco OEB, which is what he's mostly going to talk I yes, about yes, today. Yes. And with that, ah, well, hello. Oh. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? If I move around, that throws you off though, right? That's the no-no. Jan, a little bit. Okay, no, aloha ko. Um, my name is Kaneko Kukia-Schultz. I work for the Nature Conservancy and also for Kako Uibi and also for the Kupuna and Heeya, the families there. Um, today, I'm basically going to just kind of talk to you about our project, Mahua Hua Ayo Hoi, which basically means to bring back the food of Hoi. Um, in that we, and I asked around like green infrastructure, well, what is that? But, it, but we all kind of know what it is too, right? And so we hope that um, the things that we leave now walk in the footsteps of our ancestors, but also the path we trail now will keep it clear for our keiki, right? Does that make sense? Like you walk with your ancestors, but you, you walk so that your keiki can, can move, before, move beyond you. Um, so for a long time, obviously when we were in botany, we did... Uh, all kinds of things to stay active. And I hope as you go into grad student, grad school, and you're in grad school, to stay as active and advocate for the environment, advocate for your communities. If it's gonna go protest a Russian oligarch or something, I mean, just ways to get moving. Like, you guys gotta stay active, that's the main thing. Um, when we were in grad school, we were pretty, pretty active. Mihano is living where he is here, but when the fish pond right long ago, so we're old now, okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but when you're looking at an Ahupua system, um, the belief that Kakuivi has, in, in addition to the Nature Conservancy, was that the Ahupua system was beneficial and fruitful. Um, here you see, obviously, flowing water. You see a population that can sustain, it, can sustain itself from within, and the hope is, of course, that it can be resilient to climate and to other changes. Um, and yeah, so as we look at, you know, the old school Aupua image, we look at what He'e is today. Um, you see a lot of impacted areas, but you still see a lot of opportunities in land. And most importantly, the people are still there. So obviously, you know, old school, typical Aupua system, you have a healthy reef that's vibrant um, from growing fish to providing habitat and protecting you from certain tidal waves and energy. As you go further up, you see a functioning ahupua system with taro and fish, and you know, as an older system. And then obviously within the Vava areas, you have your native birds, you have your native plants, and you have a lot of the medicinal systems that we rely on traditionally. Um, presently today, of course, though, in the areas that used to have um, our native birds, uh, you see freeways and you also see impacted forests. Um, still beauty up there, of course. Uh, even in the Avava, you see houses, more houses. As you go further down, you see, um, well, what do we see in this picture? Concrete, Concrete shopping centers, mm -hmm. more houses, right? But we still have a pretty spectacular reef system. That's impacted, of course, but there's hope. Um, unfortunately, though, when it does rain, 
uh, within Yoleka and within Haiku, every waterfall is pure and white still. But the minute it reaches our area, it turns brown. And by the time it reaches the ocean with all of the impervious surfaces, it's really brown. And for Kakuivi, uh, we know that we need to build our system to try and withstand about 10,000 cubic feet a second of water, which is, that's hard. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if we can, but we're going to try, right? Because by the time it reaches the ocean, obviously you see this brown plume. And even this photo is super old because if you look at it now at the fish pond, it's, it's completely open and clear. Um, and obviously looking at what it was in the past. And so for our project, Mahua Hoi Hoi, we're looking to reclaim those images, those areas, you know. Um, so obviously with the Kolao Poko Civic Club, um, our mission is to obviously perpetuate Hawaiian culture and we're doing that through an angle on economic development, food security, and food. Uh, looking at sustainable systems, how do we build that? Uh, here you see Nick Rapoon holding some five pound kalo. Um, you have um, Kili Makua's son, Kalamai. That's Lanakila's boy. And then basically at Anu Inui school, we caught fish at the fish pond and we took it up to Anu Inui in Pololo and they acclimated basically striped mullet to pure fresh water. And that was an important process for us because we learned stories about Loko Ia, Loko Ia Kalo, Loko Wai. These are all different types of fish ponds that were found more in the Maupe area. Um, so we wanted to really have fish in Poi. We wanted to see the area as a place where we could thrive in these traditional arts that we, these traditional things that we feel as Hawaiian, we can really perpetuate again and build those systems. Um, you guys all know where Hei'a is? Have, who has been to the site? Okay, so I'd love to invite you guys for the next second Saturday. Please come down. Um, this is what it looked like in 2000. Well, pretty much 2010 when we first started. And then this is presently today, 2016. And so you can see we've been able to expand. Um, these roads are all coral. And we're looking at building a lot. We're looking at building a lot of our systems so that it is in, in interactive. I would rather do a lot more informal discussion with you guys. So I'm going to roll through this presentation. I kind of want to get into more detail and, and pick you guys' brains and stuff. So. I'll go through this and then we can ask questions. But you guys are also welcome to interrupt me. I have two kids, they interrupt me all the time. <laughs> Feel free to discuss, okay? So our current site map is obviously, um, we have 405 acres of land. We're, for, we're targeting right now 180 acres to 220 acres of wetland, depending on how you draw the map. And we're looking at growing about 160 acres of taro land. So we'll control about one third of the entire raw taro market in the state of Hawaii if we can build the system to what it was in the past. Um, this is a master plan for what Kaku would like to see in that is, is a really important part when we talk about green infrastructure because just imagine you have a wall of water probably eight feet high rolling through here. Okay, with all the impervious surface, you have a tremendous amount of energy coming right through here. We figured the best way that we can do that is to build a mock reservoir or a local water system. And that's why you see about 12 acres dedicated to a huge water system. In that, we're actually looking to try and build um, locally a kalo. So um, we're not sure what that will exactly look like. That's why we have we need you guys here and other engineers to kind of help design how the water hits and then dissipates. Um, in addition to that, then it does flow out into our lower stream. This is actually the Hea stream right here, um, which is encompassed by two large berms. And then you have the wing will fly away system, which is this. And then you have the hop top away system, which is this. And then you have the lee system, which is this. Um, for Kako Ivi, we looked at the sea worm. And you can go down there and you can kind of see what the versions existed in your community. And if you can identify where the stream is and where the diversions are, then you can actually re register them. It, there is some process in that, but we would rather not have to remake the wheel and build a whole new diversion. We'd rely on the older diversions. Because even though they're pocket names, um, we recognize that those diversions probably were built by our ancestors also. Which is on Chinese, I can say boat ancestors anyway. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the idea. And so the whole water system that we're trying to design is so that it can participate in this pulse event. 
and with that knowledge too, we acknowledge with that knowledge, we also know that you got to have a little bit of pulse in your streams too, right? So that's why having it still do a free flow through here and kind of comes out is still an important part. At least that's what we were told with uh, EV, they kind of need a little bit of a pulse so that the eggs will get washed down. Um, yeah, but in this system, as we said, this with the Kupuna, we talk about base yard for infrastructure so that we can build a lot of things. We have a community retreat center, um, Aplan agricultural forest areas, the traditional koi mill, a limu area because I'm a mycologist by heart, community center, dryland agriculture. And so within this map, you see Kapuivi trying to slowly build out those pieces. And we believe that that system even though it's, it will, it's what was done in the past, will help us become more resilient as hurricanes and everything goes in. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. But that's kind of um, our plan, our area, how we want to build out. And within that plan, we look at, you know, obviously creating sustainable food, not only focusing on taro, but, you know, you guys know what these are called? Mr. Shums, yeah. So one of the revenue streams that we look at is the high-end uh, restaurant market. And so people will pay uh, good money for a little thing of beautiful, delicious flowers. Um, this is the old photo. There is kale in the background, but we're not doing that as much anymore. Um, but what I, why I picked this image was, uh, you know, this is Heeya right here, and you can barely even see the fish pond. That's how clean it was. And this is a small Heeya, but look right below. This is Kahalu'u. And so one of the importance about this image of this is that, you know, most of Ko'olaupoko, every Aupua and Ko'olaupoko could produce taro and produce taro. And what other moku produced a ton of taro? Yeah, this, this, this is not an Aupua, this is a, what do we call this now? Um, it's not an Aupua, it's a, can I eat, what is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, real research. Look up the names of what Oahu Ahupua were called. It wasn't. It was like kind of. You know what I'm getting at. You remember it? Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Just Google it. Ahupua. Anyway. Okay, Kalamai. <laughs> what I'm getting at is obviously Manoa and Waikiki was was actually the breadbasket of Kalamai. Pulo was close behind, but when we talk about food, food production, green infrastructure, the Alawai area was, was pretty amazing. Okay. Um, back to the presentation. We're very much looking at obviously producing more poi. Um, for Kakuivi, um, we want to see Oahu feed Oahu. Um, we want to see that. And so we're very um, OG, you hear that often, Oahu grown. Uh, we very much want to push that. Uh, when our cousins from Molokai or Kauai tease us about being country, no, well, tease us about being urban, and then my response is country jack, the reality is they can feed Kauai, feed Moi, feed Molokai, and Oahu feed Oahu. And so for us, we're very pushing that, that mentality. Anyway, so eat more boy, please. <laughs> um, going back to the food security, obviously our system is much different uh, than other farms. We've been approached by different federal partners to go talk to our cousins and other islands. And this uh, method that we farm in He'ea is, is strictly for He'ea. Um, you can see we do a very much of a mounded pu'e pu'e system. And um, the reason for that is our waters are pretty anoxic, high in iron. Um, you could pour fertilizer or fish meal inside. And because of the anoxic bacteria that's present in that soil, it'll actually uh, from what we were told, it'll eat, it'll eat, we'll just absorb the nature at a faster rate. And so by doing the pu'e pu'e system, the mounded system, we found that the air and the oxygen could get in and the color could thrive. The other important thing of the pu'e pu'e system is this is after Hurricane Darby, um, a pulse of water went right over our entire system, just went right over. And because we had the pu'e pu'e suspended up in the air, it was able to harden a little bit. Um, we were harvesting out of this patch in less than two weeks after the pulse event. And so in terms of being resilient to a pulse, to a flood, um, the Pue Pue systems really did work. The drawback to the Pue Pue system is it's 
really labor intensive. You gotta physically build each by hand. And obviously we're looking at it, but from a pulse event, from a, um, a natural resource perspective, we were really happy with the success of the, the mounted system. Okay, does that make sense? So for farmers that are constantly getting flooded, they might wanna look into a Pui Pui system versus the way that their families have farmed for for hundreds of years, for hundred years because it might be more resilient to pulse events. And so for Kakoivi, so we, we might go back to a pocket style planting systems if we can, because of the volume and the return is a lot higher. In areas of heavy flooding where we can't protect it, we definitely will continue to do the Pui Pui system. Okay. Um, and of course, with the support of Nature Conservancy and our partners at HIMB, we're able to run a lot more models and systems. Okay. Do so I have any questions? Oh, okay. Uh, we're also looking at food. So one of the controversial things we've done is we have actually uh, in incorporated ungulates into our program. Um, the sheep basically don't eat taro, but they eat the California grass. And we were spending loads of money just weed whacking. Like, honestly, 80% of our labor was, was just on weed whacking. Uh, this grass that you see right here, this grass, will grow an inch a day. And one of the science projects you have with the little preschoolers is if they're coming for the, the whole week, you literally anchor the California grass down over a ruler and they take a picture and then they come back and then the next day they come back and you see it grow an inch, grow an inch, grow an inch. And it's, it was just, it was humbling to see how, how momona or how abundant the grass could grow. Um, so by integrating sheep, um, it's cut our labor force down by about two thirds. So in area, we only have to weed rack once a month now versus every 10 days. So, um, these are hair sheep. Uh, we just had our, our little dinner where we had lamb tacos, obviously. Um, but yeah, this is a bigger pui pui system that you see growing on over here. Um, so it's a real simple system where you just mound the dirt. The other thing about the pui pui system is that we're not pulling water out of the stream. For, for Oahu, we don't have the resource water. I mean, we're allowed to pull 3.5 million gallons of water off our wind motai Owai. We don't plan on pulling that amount of water. So I don't want to say the hei is not abundant in water, but we wanted to try and build a system that isn't so reliant on pulling water in. And um, this Pui Pui method seems to be less reliant on flowing water. I'm not saying that everybody has to farm this way. And, I'm, and like I said, for Hei, it works for Hei, for every other place, um, they can farm the way they need to farm. Yeah, is that, okay. I'm not saying at all that, okay, okay. Um, but basically, you guys do result chains as you guys process things. Bueller. Okay. So yeah, so for us, it's real simple. Number of people who grow food, number of families who grow food, farming training, number of people is, our, is what we want to measure. And then so if food is produced in He'eya, okay, if Kakoibi is educating farming in He'eya, so this is our family program, and food is produced in He'eya, then food is shared in the community. If food is shared in communities and families receive and share food, families eat food, families health increase due to eating native food, and then we become more food sovereign. Yeah, I mean, it's a simple, again, food is produced in He'eya, food is shown as abundant, and then back for it. And then this, this, there's another transit line where if you can show that Oahu is Momona, then there'll be a lot more pride for our kids that come out of Oahu to know that they come from an abundant land. And psychologically, that affects it. Um, with the removal of mangrove, and we're, we're going to get into that, it, you're going to see a systematic change of how we view Kaneohe. Um, anyway, sorry. So looking at flood mitigation, again, like I kind of went into it early, but the idea is if the pulse comes through here, it basically gets sieved through this whole system of <coughs> micro retainment basins, right? And these micro retainment basins not only hold water and sediment, but can hold food can create food and provide habitat for fish and birds. Um, the belief also was is that if we're allowed to capture the water, then you'll see a recharge in the spring system. And so for our partners at Pai Pao Hei'eya, they'll see an increase in spring water, which means increase in productivity and diatoms, which means more fish, right? And then a really far one is if you can increase groundwater uh, release, then you can actually stabilize 
the highs and the lows when you have these El Nino systems and the water gets really warm, but there'll always be a spring system there. And since a lot of our coral, like Paso Pura, can handle some freshwater pulse, maybe it's not going to be as sudden. Or maybe it's going to be worse. We don't, we don't know. Nah, nah, nah. Sorry. Um, and the final one is, and the mangrove is providing that. And so we're very cognizant of, as we remove this mangrove, what it could happen. But it's the sea surface buffer. It's having a buffer of fresh water that provides enough of a mass so that as a salt water wedge comes in, it's actually prevented. And as we did our research for the clearing of the mangrove and the reestablishment of the native system, we found that a grad student in the early 60s was actually finding butterfly fish at the Malka end of our mangrove forest. So right where the tower pass end, there was, yeah, right here. Basically, he was still seeing butterfly fish right up here. So either the butterfly fish, either he's lying to us, or there was a lot more of a saltwater wedge that came up. Or there, were, there was a native butterfly fish that was much more brackish than we recognized. So, but either way, that's really cool to know that fish were swimming that far out. Um, we also talked about crabs. And with the mangrove the way it is, with the fresh water, we're not seeing too many of the estuary crabs up there. So we do know that salt water probably reached a lot further up than it did presently today. Uh, this is 1928, from what I was told. And what's really cool is um, we could access this one, but the Omega station that is like way over here, they won't release it. <laughs> we, we, we want it because we want to help out Hui Kumaliola and Papahana Koola, which is Mauka in Haiku Valley. And it would help to really see what kind of tower systems were established back then. But because it was all the Omega station, it's like, it's still considered classified. Anyway, grad student, help me out, please. So, um, uh, result chain for kind of what I talked to you about, the mitigation. So obviously, if local ER are present and operating, then the volume of rainwater transport is reduced via ponding, right? If it happens via ponding, then you can reduce the force um, because of the decelerated volume. If there's less force in the water, then you can reduce the amount of plume that extends out. If you have that, then you reduce land pollution. Another way that we look at for green infrastructure mitigation of pulse events is obviously if you have rainwater ponding via tower patches, then you have a reduced rate of fresh water released into the mulibai, meaning it gets dissipated through the system. Um, another one is if you have ponding, then you have suspended sediments settled out, right? So as you increase residence time, right, the longer the residence time, the smaller the molecules would get out. Is that right? And then finally, increased water retention in the system. Um, Dr. McClatchy used to talk about the taro patches. You guys remember Will McClatchy? Well, we do, but anyway, he talked about uh, traditional, child, traditional Hawaiian aquaculture and agriculture probably increased a broader system where Hawaii actually increased water. So basically, we get like 7 billion gallons of water a day, and if we have taro patches set up in the lowland areas, it basically absorbs everything. And so you're going to see a massive recharge start to occur, massive recharge start to occur. And so over time, you'll see an actual increase in spring water systems due to the tarot systems that we are planting. Does that make sense? I just, it's cool. We want to see that again. Um, anybody want to call bullshit? No? I'm just curious. Can yeah, you, bro. you explain the, um, what you just explained about the recharge? Water? Um, when water is ponded, right? When water when water is slowed down, it either is going to go down or up, right? Yeah. And so if you have a bunch of, a bunch of retainment basins that are trapping all the water that flows, um, there's a point in time where you're going to allow for just the ground to get so saturated because of tarot systems that it's going to maximize the recharge. So one of the big questions we had with, with the Waiholi water ditch system was that it's taking Waiholi water and taking it to the Ever Plains. It's basically taking a river and flowing it out in the Ever Plains. What that did was it it maximized water recharge in the Ever Plains and kind of grossly um, created a lot of springs in Ever. So it, it didn't surprise anybody that when Waihole went back to well, a portion of it went back, and you see all these major sugarlands stop flowing out. All of that water that was going into the sugarlands is no longer being recharged. So you saw a massive decrease of spring systems in Ever. And to um, compound that, then you saw the armoring of Eva, which then created even less recharge. That's all I'm saying. So having ponding systems and, and being able to pull off uh, pulse events and rain systems, right? 
um, basically allow for more and more recharge, which then increases spring water systems. The water people, Kim Polinsky should be talking more about this, but anyway, that's what I was told. So, and it made sense, right? Because um, for my gener, like I remember in my freshman year, we were able to still find Nemo in Elva, and that's like the early 90s. And we knew that as sugar stopped on Maui, we would see that, that collapse. And unfortunately, we're, we're witnessing it now. Yeah, we've seen the hypnial beds of Maui. You're seeing just the full collapse of all of that system. And the irony was that sugar probably created a, an imbalance of water spring systems over there. That's all, you know. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying about water and movement? I'm saying with the there probably was more limu historically because the forest was intact but with the forest getting cleared for planting and then having water being poured into that area it kind of made up for and I'm not saying that was the right thing I'm just saying it, it basically it masked the complete collapse of that water system and so once the water was pulled away from the agricultural system and armored with housing, then you saw a complete collapse of the productivity system with the Lima. Yeah, that's all. That's all I'm saying. So now that corn is back, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so one of the bigger projects that we're looking at now is obviously the removal of the mangrove and the restoration of the native wetland system. Uh, we look at that as a green infrastructural project because we're rebuilding again. And that's where we can call, we can argue and have the BS because yes, I acknowledge we're clearing a mangrove forest, but we're also revitalizing a traditional Hawaiian wetland set system that was non-existent, that is non-existent right now. I think on Kauai, in Hanapepe, maybe Dars, they're, they're doing a major restoration there, right? Yeah, and Mana, but, but really in Heea on Oahu, you don't see that native system back. And so we recognize from the Nature Conservancy where we spend millions of dollars restoring mangrove forests, it is, you know, we are clearing some mangrove here, but we're looking to restore the native wetland sedge system, the grass system, this image here, that showed a lot more productivity in terms of fish and birds and everything. And then, of course, the wetland restoration. So we're trying to return it back to this image where you can see open water, obviously taro system, taro right here. And what was really cool about this photo is there actually is still a ton of walls that were built internally in the system to try and navigate the water out safely. And so that's kind of what we're looking for. And we obviously welcome you guys to come out and help us or document that. Question. Yeah, of course. Uh what work have you guys done with H dot on Kamehameha Highway there in that mangrove? Because that they have they have a voice or an interest or a lack of in Hea. H dot. Hawaii DOT. Oh, we talked sure responsible for the road. Yeah, yeah. Personally. We yeah, they've been a little active over there, haven't they? Um we, we <laughs> talked to them and because it's it's considered state private, yeah. um, they're fine. The other issue that we had was the clearing of the trees around the Hiko power line. And they said, as long as it's a certified arborist, we should have no problem dropping it near the power line. Um, so we talked with DOT about, there'll, there'll be um, posters coming up soon about the restoration process. And we know that the posters are gonna get liberated, but that's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll keep them up. Um, but it's just, it's just to inform and keep everybody aware about it, right? Because on the Makai side of Pai Pai, by Pai Pai and Hui, uh, Hui Poko and the state parks, they've cleared a lot of that area and just the, uh, just an anoxic layer that used to be right at the surface and now they're almost like a foot deep of aerobic sand and then anoxic layer below. I mean, so, is that okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, right. It was awesome in the beginning, but now, but it's, it's really cleaning itself yeah. out better than we ever, I mean, amazing to see the biomass that's returning to it. And so we, we recognize that mangrove has evolved, mangrove is non-native. Um, and it creates kind of this anoxic system that really doesn't support native systems. Um, but it is a lot of carbon, yeah? I, I acknowledge that. So anyway, yeah. And that's kind of what we want to return it back to. Um, so this newer project obviously is in partnership with Nature Conservancy, NOAA, 
um, Pacific Service Center, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Army Corps of Engineers, and all of that. And that's kind of our next bigger green infrastructural project. But I really wanted, yeah, and that, that's kind of the end. But I really wanted to get back to, you know, well, let's have a discussion. This is, this is our, our bigger project. This is what we really want to see. Um, we see it as sustainable. We see it as an opportunity to grow and provide food. Okay, anyway, let's talk. All right. So, you know, it was back in the native way, and I need to get back to how it was. There wasn't an abolition meant to be different from it. Right. And I know that you were thinking about just the underwater and the culture, but it, <coughs> is that going to be enough, do you think, now that there is all this cement? The cement will still be up above. It's still going to be very much armored, absolutely. And so we knew that the pulse that came in the 60s was a, a tremendous system. And that was right at the beginning of when it started to get armored. Um, the hope is, is that with the reestablishment of the tarot system, right? Because the 60s is already, now, now I want to get back to my, my computer where I can show them the, the pictures. Because in the, when the pulse, when it finally broke through the fish pond wall in the 60s, the fish, the wetland itself was already, um, there weren't tarot patches in it. So we believe that if we can regrow the tarot systems and recognize that some of the areas will never be tarot because they're built to mitigate the pulse, uh, we think and we hope that we can, we can absorb it. Um, but the importance though to the clearing of the mangrove is the, the fact that we can reestablish the native wetland system again. So I, I, I want my kids to be able to see the native Alaiula, the I.O., the systems that were there. I want them to be able to look at the, the long-eyed mud crab. Um, I want them to be able to see those systems. And I, I want to make sure that people, it's not called the Stink Bridge. It's actually a beautiful, fragrant, open-watered area that should be. Meheanu wasn't this dark. I mean, she is, but it's, she's also much more brilliant. Uli is not this black, dark thing. It's much more light than people give it credit for. I don't. This is an old school computer. Your final slide. Yeah. <laughs> the final slide? Oh, you don't want to contact me. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's admin at kakooevi.org or kshultz at tnc.org. Or is it just, it's just old photos of what the land was can as, as, can we pull oh yeah, if can we, we can, because I can, because if I could pull it up, <laughs> yeah, no, like I, I was here to talk more about the system, like, so if you guys want like a business model canvas, financing, how we build systems, I'm all, I'm here to talk. So I, I wanted to get through the system and then kind of the top story. That's why. Because you guys had a, I mean, back in my day. Sorry. Can you talk a little about how you plan for seeing what you're So the irony, and we talked with um, Chip Fletcher, is that for our native, if I'm taking the Nature Conservancy hat, and I want to see a reestablishment of a native system in an estuary and habitat, I want to crash it with salt water. Because our species have evolved so well with salt, I mean, even our taro can, a lot of our taro can withstand salt intrusion. Um, what we're finding at the fish pond, because the salt is coming in, the native akiaki, akulikuli, um, the carrots, I mean, they're all coming in. Like, it's, there's ahu ahu, they're, they're, they're able to withstand that. And then the California graph, which Kakuibi is very concerned about, is actually getting batted back. And so one of the things we did with Army Corps of Engineers is, um, in order to do a lot of the restoration work, you have to show that the non-tidal, all of the varieties in the wetland, of the man all the varieties on the Malka side of the bridge and the mangrove are actually considered non-tidal wetland areas, which allows us to operate with heavy equipment and do things quicker because the vegetation is all saying it's, it's fresh. And so um, we know that as we clear the mangrove, we'll see that saltwater wedge come up. And so for Kakuivi, we, you know, that's why that aquaculture piece is so important. That's why in that, um, You know, in that photo, this location right here is basically um, 
we're doing a lot of freshwater fish ponds, local Iacalo, so that um, he'ia will become more salt. And then this might become the Kuapa style estuary system as sea level rises. And so we're, we're trying to build that in, you know. Have you seen anything? So anecdotally, I've heard um, some of the managers that some of the other wetlands say that um, with finding California grass, if they have more salt water coming into the system, it helps them digest. Like yes, yeah. absolutely. And that's, and that's the sadness of it. Like one of the first things we're going to find is that, and, we were, and the thing is we were watching during the king tides, right? We saw no saltwater wedge, no saltwater signal in, in our mangrove posts, right? We have uh, Kim, Kim, Kate to talk to you guys, Kim Polinsky. And, you know, um, we didn't see too much of that. Even during the, the tsunami, we did see the fresh water build up, but we still saw no trace of salt in it. So we know that the mangrove and the clay that the mangrove has accrued is definitely impacting saltwater wedge coming in. From a, from a Hawaiian natural, Hawaiian perspective, that's a bad thing, right? Because salt water actually helps to um, give that competitive advantage back to the native systems by killing the California grass, by killing the papyrus that you see inside there. Um, so it's just kind of how do we balance that out? Yeah, sorry, did I, I hope I answered it. Yeah, I mean, it's, so I, I look at salt water intrusion as a, well, I'm gonna try to stop it, of course, but, um, it's one of those ways to keep us humble, I guess. So, yeah. No, oh. Okay. What are you seeing there, So, um, once we opened up this system right over here, uh, we've had about six successful fledglings. So we've had five. We've had six nests, five seasons of successful fledglings okay. from I/O. And we recently had a Ula um, start to go right inside here. So the irony is, um, right here <laughs> is a white lotus. Um, yeah, white. You know the white lotus lily pads. After Hurricane Darby, it exploded through the mangrove and into this area here. And now we have white lotus lily pads all in this area. So when everybody comes in, it was beautiful because you see these beautiful white lotuses that honestly $50 a plant. Um, but that has actually brought the Alai Ula to come out and, and, and live on it. Whereas we've, we heard them before, we've just never seen them before. So if you guys want white lily pads, white lotus, come on out. We'll, yeah. If grad students get tired of peanut butter and Simon, are you guys poor grad students or rich grad students? <laughs> Cause I heard you guys pay them well now, huh? Uh, you try, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, that that's kind of where that's that's where we're we're at. And again, like um, I don't I don't have all the answers. I, I'm just we're just trying to to move and and see and not do more harm, but yet still push. I'm curious with the removal of the mangrove, you're obviously releasing sediment. So, are you, how are you planning for that? What they're finding right now, which is a trip, yeah. is that the organic matter from the mangrove is releasing sediment now. So, what they found with the lower system was there was a release of pulse. And, of yeah, with the physical removal and then a decrease after that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we're setting up booms. We're gonna try and lock them in with the road first before they, they drop everything so that it at least tries to slow it down to the best of its ability. But um, what we found at the fish pond, and if, I, I really rec recommend you guys going to the fish pond, is that when you look at this photo here, this was cut when we first started in 2000, wow, well, yeah, 2003, and the root map is still there. So what it, showed for us or gave us a little bit of pause to know that the root mat is it released a little bit slower than it's not like a full bleed out mm -hmm. and with that said and because it's hoy we're cursed over there we're going to cut the mangrove and it's just going to pulse and rip everything out and and he is going to be super the fish pond will be super <laughs> happy with me so so i mean it, we're, we're going to try and mitigate it to the best of our ability obviously nature conservancy is on it we're not we're not going to risk damaging more than nature so we're trying to set up sediment booms we're going to do the enclosures when they cut 
Um, but also there is a cost to it. So they do have to be safe and they do have to drop the trees pretty quickly. But, um, and again, that's the other reason why we're only removing a third of it. <laughs> we're removing the middle section. And so the hope is we remove the middle section, have some really good knowledge and data on, on the best methods that we can do. Um, get more money and contract the contractor to remove the Malka portion. And then the last step is the KS State Park land, which is the Makai section. And that, that's the hope. Um, like I said, you know, if our science is telling us and our kupuna are telling us that this is wrong, I have no problem stopping. And I know within five years, the mangrove from above will, will recolonize it. So, yeah. So when, when is this happening? Like two weeks. Uh, the contract came in. We we're going to hopefully award the, individu the individuals, the organization. And uh, probably by the 1st of July, we'll, we'll start. So there's no way I can get this photo, yeah? this image right here on my computer to show them. Anybody have a HDMI um, jack? This is an old school computer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I just basically wanted to show you guys this photo where basically, you know, with Google Earth, you can put in all kinds of image. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, but it's it's really cool. You can do old overlays of your image and then you could basically use the streets that were present in the 20s and you can basically scroll back and forth. So, you know, with that technology and that ability, we were able to show exactly where our old command now highway road is in the system. Can I go back? Yeah, so we were able to scroll in and actually. That's as big as you can get, huh? Anyway, um, we were able to scroll in and actually see where this road is. And so for Kako Ivy and the Nature Conservancy, we are looking to revitalize that road system and make it as um, as civvy as possible, meaning we don't want the road to withstand or hold water. We want it to be able to breathe through it because we recognize that um, when roads hold water, when this road will hold water, it actually build up too much of a force, which then could be detrimental to the fish pond. So we want to put as many coverts in there as we can so that when it does pulse, it just goes right through the wall. You guys been to Koloko Honokaha on Big Island? It's all stone, and so when the wave hits it, it actually goes right through it. No, see those those old fish pond dry stack systems. That's that's pretty much the idea that we want. And we recognize with organic matter that we have in the wetland that that those holes are gonna clog pretty quick. So we gotta constantly be maintaining that. But that's that's the hope that we have for this system is is rebuilding that. And then with this access, then we can rebuild these old roads and these old walls to get in and, and really restore this system here. Um, so when you drive on the Kamehameha Highway Bridge, the Slink Bridge, look at how wide that road is and look at that it's the same width on this road itself too. <laughs> so, um, and there were Hale all through here too, which is really awesome. Like there was, it's such a, it was such a really interesting system. Anyway, I digress. Any questions? Yeah. We are fortunate to still have Kupuna that remember these images here. Um, and so when we look at a more holistic system, we look at a system that could support communities, which we think is the more um, ideal way to go. Um, that's why basically I, I go back to when everything they could have was provided for them in that area. And it's just, I mean, that's basically, if, if you know the if you know the train is got how do I say this? Going back to that, the post Ahupua system as you can get is what our kupuna remember, and the stories that we read. And so balancing Nani Kikumu and reading the Kapoi Kahiko and seeing how it was done then, native planters, 
reading those testimonies that were done in the 18, you know, in the 18th century. And then having like Auntie Alice Hewitt and Carol Bright, and when they talked about the sound of rain as Mullet came up, we can all use those cues and mo'olela to kind of add the ike that we need to make it for the future, I guess is the best way. And, that, and, and that's where, if, if I could go back to the, I don't know, 1700s, let's, let's see, and if, if that was sustainable, we, we can try it, you know? And, and granted, I, I, I like my ice smokers. I, I mean, we got a balance, right? But it's, um, I haven't had them in a while, though. But um, <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just how do we, how do we move forward together, right? Um, if we knew the population uh, before Cook arrived could be support, could be equal to the size of population that we have now, um, that's that's probably a good system to look into. So, and with with all the the current technologies that we have, um, I think we could support more, right? And so it's about survival. So I mean, I use the Ikea Var Kupuna as another tool that we can use to further us today and that, uh, sorry yeah so that's why so how far back do we go i don't know as, as many tools as i could fit in my belt right that's that's in the end what we're going to do because i mean like rob tudin helping us with connectivity i mean there's some awesome research that's coming out that that actually um agrees with a lot of our modelo and so we're just like yeah makes sense okay good now we can go get it now we can get funding so and, and really get this land rich anyway what do you think is the time horizon for how you can get back to that? I mean, see, I really want to get into the computer now. No, no, no. Uh, it's, it's about capital. And, that, and that's the thing. It's like you guys sit at the university with so we, we have opportunities here to really change how Hawaii moves and Hawaii thinks. You know, when, when we were in grad school, we created Pai Pao Heia. I really want you guys to go out and create your own little niches so that when you're almost 40, you can come talk to the 20 year old grad student and, and see how we've all changed Hawaii for the better, I hope. Um, and also, you know, with Scheidler, with NRAM, I mean, this program is awesome. You guys can really make that change and, and create Hawaii to be sustainable. Make, the, make that effort to move. Um, I didn't answer your question really well, but um, I don't know. Anyway, I, I, I just, there's so many cool things at the UH, like every time I come read things, I'm learning stuff. So it's just like, oh, I can, I can apply that now. <coughs> you know, I was talking with Kiana Frank today, right? Because we're looking for a bacteria that might be able to convert ulu. Oh, you can turn this off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry guys, if you're on the message, we're going black now, we're going cold. <laughs> And now the presentation is over. Now we can really talk.